about a person by looking at their handiwork. You know, what, whether, whether it's an artist that you're talking about and studying the painting that they've created, you can tell a lot about them by looking closely. Or if it's a carpenter, you know, by looking at whatever it is that they've constructed and taking a close look at the finished work, perhaps you can, you can tell a lot about that carpenter. Or if it's a chef, by the taste of the food, which obviously is at the top of the list, but presentation sometimes is important too. So you can tell a lot about a chef by, by studying their handiwork. A musician, by listening carefully, you can tell a lot about a person that's a musician. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that as we look at the world around us, it reveals to us the Creator. It says something about God. In fact, this is the very line of thought that Paul took in Romans chapter 1, and, and this is only one verse of, actually there are several verses here, but, but this one verse really hits the nail on the head. When he made this comment, he said, from the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly observed in what he made. As a result, people have no excuse. Hey, you can tell a lot about an individual by looking at their handiwork. And for the record, I understand that there are those who refuse to acknowledge the role of a creator. I know that full well. They choose instead to believe alternative explanations as to, to the existence of everything that is around us. And I get that. But I guess to a certain degree, I've always been, you know, a bit simple-minded, you know, in the way that I approach things. I mean, think about it. If you went on a long hike out into the woods, you packed up a backpack, and you put some water in there, and you put some food, and figuring that this hike was going to involve all day, and you went out into the woods, and you were fighting your way through the underbrush, you know, for a mile and a half or so, and then you came upon a, a swollen creek, and, uh, you know, you didn't realize the water level was going to be where it was. You looked until you found a fallen tree, and you did a balancing act crossing over that creek on that tree, and then you continued to fight through some underbrush, and you came to, to some jagged rock formations and all, and you climbed over the top of that, and you continued another mile or so, and eventually you came to an opening, a clearing in the woods, a small one, but nonetheless, a clearing. And as soon as you broke into the clearing, the first thing that catches your eye is the light, the light of a fire burning surrounded by a ring of rocks. And next to that, there was a stack of wood over to the side. And as you approach it, then you see that right next to the stack of wood, there's a, a tree stump. And you look down on the tree stump, and there's a package of hot dogs laying there. And there's a, a stick that has a sharp point on it leaning against the tree stump. And you look down, and there's a there's an open can of Coke down at the, the bottom, down on the ground, right next to the stump. What would you conclude? I mean, you just happened upon this, and you've been, you've been fighting your way in the woods for several hours, and you haven't happened upon a single person. You come into this clearing, and now you see all this. What are you going to conclude? You're going to conclude that someone was recently there, right? Right? I mean, that totally seems like the logical conclusion to make. There, there, there's no one who would start speculating by thinking that, wow, you know, there must have been some kind of a windstorm and a tree was blown over and the force of it hitting the ground caused it to break into individual pieces. And then there was a flash flood that came washing through and, and it, it kind of stacked up some of the wood here and, and settled some of the other wood right in the middle of an area that had washed the dirt off and there was some rocks, 
just underneath the surface of the soil, and, and uh, you know, and, and it must have been, you know, four or five baby squirrels that crawled up on the tree stump and died, you know, and I mean, that's what hot dog meat is, right? Um, that, that's, that's uh, I mean, you wouldn't be speculating stuff like that. You wouldn't be trying to come up with some kind of a natural explanation because you would instinctively know that this site had been visited by someone in the not-too-distant past. And see, here's the thing. The universe we live in is a million times more complex than any campfire ever thought of being. It is only natural that we conclude that a supernatural being has been here. The indicators are all over the place. Whether you talk about the immensity of the size of the universe that we're in. And, and this, this has kind of been the neat thing within many of our lifetimes, you know, the Hubble telescope and, you know, and, and what that has, has helped us to open our eyes and to see more than, than any human being had ever seen before and to see into the far reaches of space. And what we're being told now is that the Milky Way galaxy is one of billions of galaxies and as far as galaxies stack up, the Milky Way isn't even that incredibly impressive. It's kind of average, you know, in size to all these other billions of galaxies that are estimated to be out there in space. The Milky Way galaxy, which our solar system is just kind of on the fringe of one of the rings of, of the Milky Way galaxy, it only takes up, the entire Milky Way galaxy only takes up, they say, one trillionth of known space. And they said that if, if you take the Milky Way galaxy out and just poof it into non-existence and it's no longer there anymore, it would be similar as taking one pine needle out of a large forest. It would have that much impact into the known universe. I mean, they just in some sort of a way, kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse of how immense our universe is. But it's not just the size of our universe. It's also the orderliness of our universe. The Earth, you know, we're told, and we've been told this for a long time, rotates on its axis at a tilt of 23 degrees, which, of course, allows for a greater surface area to be tilled, to be farmed. It allows for the different seasons of the year. You know, if it wasn't tilted like that, that all wouldn't be possible. That part most of us have known, and something somewhere along the line I didn't really pay attention to, is that the earth rotates at 1,000 miles an hour. That's how fast it's spinning. If you slowed the rotation of the earth down, down to 100 miles an hour, down to just a tenth of the speed that it is going now, then the days and nights would be ten times longer than they are now which means that the summer sun would burn off everything as far as vegetation is concerned. And the winter nights would be bitterly cold, unbearably cold. And the closest thing that we have to compare that to is the moon. The moon, a lunar day on the moon is, is uh, um, 15 earth days. That's how slow the, the moon is moving. 15 Earth days. And, and so what that creates on the moon is that, temperature-wise, there is a high of 214 degrees above zero. Then the other extreme is 243 degrees below zero. So if you slowed the Earth's rotation down to a tenth of what it is now, life wouldn't be able to survive as we know it. I mean, that's just one example of the design written into the creation around us. We could break it down even further. We can take something like uh, the human eyeball, just one, one component of our bodies, the human eyeball. We are told that there are 200,000 200, plus photoreceptors in every square millimeter of the retina. And the retina um, is as thin as saran wrap but yet, at the same time, it's made up of eight different layers, even though it's that thin. 
Each layer does a separate chemical reaction so that it can convert light energy into electrical energy and therefore send messages to the brain to be able to interpret and to be able to see images. You know, so you, you look at the delicate design of something as small as an eyeball. You know, and you, the list could go on. I mean, photosynthesis, you know, a lot of us maybe would have to go on the Wikipedia or something to get a refresher course because it was a long time ago in school that we learned about that. But you look at all the different components that are necessary to line up in order for photosynthesis to take place. Or you look at how water, when water freezes, most things when it freezes, freezes, it condenses, meaning it gets heavier. But water, you know, the, the, the chemicals that make up water, it expands when it freezes, thus making it lighter than water. It makes it lighter than it was before. Therefore, ice floats on water, which then makes it possible in the winter for a protective shield to be established on the top of that pond or lake or, or that river to where it could be sub-zero degrees above the ice, but below it's 39 degrees. And all the fish and all that are fine and protected. You talk about snowflakes, and you know we've long been told that there are no two snowflakes just alike. I'm not really sure who has studied that, you know, to know that for sure. I know I haven't, um, and even if I had, my memory's not good enough to, to recall, but, but we've seen pictures, enlarged pictures of snowflakes. I mean, sometimes big snowflakes, even when they fall on a window, you know, of your car or your house, and, and it's there momentarily just for a few seconds, and you can see the intricate design of a single snowflake. Yeah, the indicators are all over the place. Some would call it God's fingerprints, all over the place. This is why David, who you remember David when, when he was growing up, before he was ever the king of Israel, before he ever faced off in battle against Goliath, what was David's occupation? He was a shepherd. Back in those days, they, uh, they didn't have MP3 players and all that kind of stuff. And so when he would, when he would uh, um, get ready to go to bed at night, sleeping with the flock of sheep, he didn't have a whole lot to occupy his time until he went to sleep. And so he'd look up in the night sky and he'd see the stars. And one of the things that inspired him to say in Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, God does not exist. He thought it was foolish to even draw such a conclusion. In fact, he goes into more detail in another one of his psalms, Psalm 19, where it says, how clearly the sky reveals God's glory, how plainly it shows what he has done. Each day announces it to the following day. Each night repeats it to the next. No speech or words are used. No sound is heard. Yet their message goes out to all the world and is heard to the ends of the earth. You see, to David, the conclusion was pretty clear. The message of the Bible is that it's more than just that God arranged things in an orderly fashion in creation. The message of the Bible is more than that God constructed things. The message that we get from the Bible is that God made something out of nothing. That is the message that comes through clearly. And you see that in, in more than one passage of Scripture, but honestly, you don't even need to go beyond the first verse of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first sentence of Scripture says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word that is used there for created is only used of divine creative activity. It's never used of something that a human being does. I mean, there are words that are translated created in regards to people, but it's not this Hebrew word. The only time this Hebrew word is used is in regards to God, and it means to bring something into existence out of nothing. To, to bring something about out of nothing. The beginning of the story, if you look closely at that first verse, 
The beginning of the story does not begin with creation, however. It begins with God. In the beginning, God. Moses says nothing of God's origin because there's nothing to say. God had no origin. God had no beginning. And, and Moses learned that kind of firsthand when he was there at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. You'll remember that God was speaking forth to him from that burning bush and he was giving him instructions. He wanted him to go back to Egypt to lead out the Israelites who had been in bondage. They had been there in Egypt for some 400 years. And Moses was like, but if I go back there, they may ask me, like, who sent me? And I don't even know your name. What do I tell them when they ask, who sent me? And that's when God said, tell them, I am that I am has sent you. You know, with God, there never was a beginning point. He always has been, I am. It's always been the present. He's, he's above time and space. He didn't have a beginning. He won't have an ending. God predates everything. Now, if I was to take a dump truck over to your house this afternoon, and I was to dump a load of nothing into your driveway, and, 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 and in a generous fashion, I'd say, you know what? I'm going to give you all week. Report back next Sunday regarding what... Uh, uh, what you were able to do with this truckload of nothing. I mean, what would you be able to do with it? A truckload of nothing right there in your driveway. Well, yeah, nothing. You wouldn't be able to do anything with it. But that's not the story with God. God can take nothing and He can create everything out of it. See, it's a totally different story for Him because He is God. And that's the way the Bible begins, by explaining that. Sometimes people try to trick other people into thinking they can produce something out of nothing. You know, you'll see a magician or someone, you know, holding a hat and showing how empty the hat is. And before you know it, he's pulling a rabbit out of the hat or, or he's showing his hands, they're completely empty. And then he pulls a coin out from behind someone's ear and, and giving the impression he's creating something out of nothing. But in reality, that's just simply a matter of illusion and trickery is all that is. Only God can create something from nothing. The main character of the Bible is introduced in the very first sentence of the Bible. And I've heard it said before, and I'm in total agreement with this, and you've probably heard this as well. If you can believe the first sentence of the Bible, you shouldn't have any problem believing anything else that's written in the Bible. If you can believe the first sentence of Scripture. There shouldn't be anything else that you have a problem with. And it doesn't matter if it's a guy and a big fish or a guy and a donkey or a man that dies and gets raised back to life again. If you believe that first sentence, all of a sudden, you can believe all the rest of what is recorded in Scripture. And that goes on to caused me to say this in regards to creation. This serves as the backdrop of the entire Bible's message. It's no accident that Genesis is located at the start of the Bible. It's there for a good reason, because it lays the groundwork for all of the rest of Scripture, all the rest of what is stated. Last Sunday on your connection card, we had a survey question like we do all Sundays, in fact, there's one on there today pertaining to next Sunday's message, and I know a lot of you will chime in on that. Well, last Sunday, a bunch of people responded to our survey question. Here's what it was. It said, in your mind, how significant is the teaching that God created everything? And we had a lot of good answers come back as a result of that question. Uh, but here's one I just got to relay to you because I felt like this was dead on. This was a bullseye answer. Uh, one person wrote these words down to that question, said, it's the foundation for everything we believe. And I absolutely agree with that. And I agree with that because I totally believe that is the way it's presented in the Bible, that we have that understanding. If you take Genesis chapters 1 and 2 out of the Bible, the rest of the Bible would be like a building without a ground floor. Because that's what 
the beginning of Genesis serves as being. It's the ground floor. And everything else then is built upon that. Let me just give you a, a, a sampling of this. Kind of like when you take a rock to a pond and you skip a rock and it just kind of skims the surface in several spots. Let's just do that regarding Scripture in the next couple of minutes. You know, regarding the teaching of Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Okay? So let's just kind of hit, hit just certain spots skipping across the surface of Scripture. Gen, or Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9 is a good passage to read. It says, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars, by the breath of His mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into a heap. He puts the depths into storehouses. Let the whole earth tremble before the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in all of Him. For He spoke, and it came into being. He commanded, and it came into existence. You see, the psalmist is drawing reference back to the very beginning of Genesis chapter 1. Look at something Moses wrote, one of the psalms that's attributed to him. Psalm 90, the opening verses say, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You see, Moses, his perspective, his point of orientation is that God was the one that brought everything about. In Nehemiah, you've got to travel forward a bit in time. This is when uh, people that had been taken to captivity in Babylon were beginning to return. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this, And then the people of Israel prayed this prayer, You, Lord, you alone are Lord. You made the heavens and the stars of the sky. You made land and sea and everything in them. You gave life to all. The heavenly powers bow down. And worship you. Even in the center of the Ten Commandments, you see a reference back to Genesis 1. In Exodus 20, verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for, for you are to labor six days and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, for the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And declared it holy. So even written into the Ten Commandments, there's a reference to how God created everything. On your outline, I've put the memory verse down at the bottom of your outline. And even if you're not in the habit of memorizing Scripture, every week we try to give you a verse that characterizes the message as one to memorize. And here it is, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. It's a great statement. The prophet says this, O oh Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and with your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. See, that's the point that he's making. Is God, nothing's too difficult for you, but what is he drawing reference to? Genesis chapter 1. You go over into the New Testament, and the theme continues. I mean, all these different references back to the very beginning, the creation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4, it says, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created. Yeah, and again, I say, that's just scratching the surface. You know, I just touched on, what, seven passages or so? And, and those aren't even the high points. Those are just samplings of what happens throughout the rest of the Bible as it keeps drawing reference back to Genesis chapter 1. Now, I know full well that there are some who are bound and determined to explain God out of the equation. You know, I know that that happens, that there are some people that, uh, that they don't even want the thought of God entering into discussion. Even the Bible draws reference to them. In Psalm 10, verse 4, it says, In his pride the wicked does not seek him, and all his thoughts there is no room for him. Yeah, there, there's people that, that don't even want God to be a part of the equation. But the problem then is how do you explain all of this? Everything that we see whether it be in the night sky or by the sunlight during day, the day. How do we explain all of this? And thus, we have the theory of evolution. 
a naturalistic explanation that attempts to explain away any need for God. Now, I'm just going to say this about it because sometimes we make this whole debate and everything much more complicated than I believe it really is. There's really only two alternatives when it comes to everything that we see, whether when we look into the mirror or when we look out at the world around us or at the stars at night. There's really only two alternatives. One, it all came about by chance. That's one alternative that it all came about by chance. It's random happenstance. It's just an accident. Some kind of a domino effect that one thing led to another and presto changel, whoa, look what what we ended up with. It all came about by chance. And I'm I'm talking not just about animal life and stuff like that. I'm I'm talking about, you know, the the explanations about this this idea of a Big Bang theory or or a concentrated bunch of gases that got together and that, you know, eventually, you know, evolved into material matter and all this kind of... the, The question still exists. Where did the gas come from? Where did that little atom or molecule that exploded, where did that come from? And the answer has to be, it came about by chance. Okay? So that's one alternative, if you're ruling God out of the equation. The other alternative is it all came about by design. Those really are the two alternatives you have. It came about by chance, or it came about by design. It was purposefully made this way by someone. And the question that you and I and everyone else has to ask is, what's more plausible? That it came about by chance, everything? That it came by chance or that it came by design? That's the question you've got to answer answer is, what's more plausible? It's my opinion that it's not always the evidence that causes people to reject the notion of creation. I think there's another factor that plays into this. You know, besides people just saying this or that about whatever evidence that exists, I believe that there are some moral implications that complicate this whole debate for some people. I mean, follow the line of thinking a little bit. If everything has been created, then that means that there is a supreme being, okay? Natural progression of thought here. If everything has been created, then that means there is a supreme being. And if there is a supreme being, that means that you and I are not supreme. Okay? We were created. And and if we are not supreme and we've been created, then that means that there is a creator. And if there is a creator, then that means that there is someone who has authority over us. And if there is someone who has authority over us, then that means that he makes the rules. You see, the logical progression of thought creates a moral implication that for some people is unacceptable, regardless of whatever evidence is or isn't out there. They cannot accept that, the moral implications. So with all of that being said, what impact does knowing this have on me? What kind of impact should this have on you? There's four things I want to suggest to you, you know, in regards to the kind of impact that I know that it has on me. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but number one, it convinces me there is a God. And that, that's the very line of thought that Paul was taking in Romans chapter 1. I showed you verse 20 earlier, but if you look at the preceding couple of verses as well, you'll see that that is his argument there. Is, is that by looking around us, by looking into nature and, and, and looking into the sky, that that convinces us that there is a God. Now, we may not be able to know, you know Him in a very personal way as a result of all that, but we can know that there is a God, and we can know that He is a powerful God. You see, even without the Bible, we can come to that conclusion. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1. It convinces me that there is a God. Number two, it reminds me, I'm not an accident. You know, I'm not the result of happenstance. You know, I, my life is not just a random occurrence that just, wow, yeah, just happened into existence over a long period of time. No. 
No, knowing that God created things, I'm not here by chance. It helps me to understand that. In fact, I've only shown you one verse in Genesis chapter 1. Let me show you one other verse, and this is verse 26, and this is what the video was leading up to that you watched a few minutes ago. It says this, Then the Lord said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and creatures that crawl on the earth. And and, and there's the first reference to mankind. You might notice, I mean, you can't help but notice, especially when you capitalize those personal pronouns, that those personal pronouns are in the plural form, us and our. Be reminded of the fact that angels did not create you, did not create this world. God is the creator. This is evidence of the Trinity right in the very first chapter. And it's not the only evidence. There's more evidence in Genesis chapter 1 of the Trinity. But, but we're told in the New Testament that Jesus was there when the foundations of the earth were laid, when things were created. He was creating. There's multiple passages, John 1, Hebrews 1, places Colossians chapter 1 in the New Testament that bear that out. So we have reference right here in the plural pronoun, God the Father and God the Son, creating all things. And it's talking specifically in that verse about people. We did not come about gradually over long, 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 long stretches of time from lower life forms, but rather instead we were created intentionally in the image of God. And that's what the Scripture is saying. And yeah, everything else was created intentionally by God too, but there's something special about mankind because what this passage is telling us is that we, unlike everything else in creation, we have been created in His image. And that makes people special. You are not the result of an accident a random occurrence that took place eons of time ago. You're here because God intended for you and I to be here. We were created intentionally. Now, while we're on the verse, go ahead and throw this out there. Why did he create woman second? He created man first. You know, there's been a debate on that for a long time. And just, you know, After countless hours of research, let me just share, you know, the conclusions. They're falling into two schools of thought. According to female scholars, they answer the question, why did he create woman second after creating man? They answer it like this. It is because after creating man, God looked at what he had had made and he said, I can do better than that. (laughs) But then there's some male scholars that weigh in on things. And and I know like Joe, you know, he believes this wholeheartedly. Um, They say, why did God create the woman second after creating man? Their answer to that is, he saved the woman for last because God didn't want any advice all the way through creation. <laughs> so, so now you have something to talk about during lunch. <laughs> All right. So what impact? The, the fact that the Bible establishes so clearly in the opening page of Scripture, but then it just keeps reminding us, you know, just throughout the rest of Scripture, it keeps drawing reference back to the fact that God is the Creator and that this isn't the result of chance, that God intentionally created all things out of nothing. What impact should that have on us? It should convince us that there is a God. Secondly, it should remind us that we are not an accident. And thirdly, it should compel us to worship Him. The realization of the fact that we have a Creator and that we owe everything to our Creator because we would not even exist had it not been for Him. And I'll just show you one verse on this that I think you know, does a good job 
appropriately from the book of Psalms, Psalm 95, verse 6. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Yeah, He's our Maker. And so the natural response should be to kneel down before Him, to worship Him. And then we have number four, the fourth impact all this should have on us. It, should re, re, it reassures me that nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. If God was able to take nothing and create everything out of it in such wonder, in such splendor, if God was able to do that, nothing is too hard for God. And I draw reference back to the verse that is our memory work for this week. Jeremiah 32, verse 17, where it says, O Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and earth by your great power. And with your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. You see, there's a reason why when, when the Virgin Mary had asked that messenger angel, Gabriel, said, how is it possible that I'm going to be with child? Because I've never been with a man in that way before. How is it possible? What did Gabriel the angel say? He said, nothing is impossible with God. Echoing the very words of the prophet Jeremiah. Nothing is too difficult for God. And all you got to do is, is look with the backdrop of all of creation behind us to be continually reminded of that truth. Our ushers are going to be getting up at this time and preparing for our time of communion. And while they are making those preparations, I just want to share just a couple of closing thoughts here before we pray and prepare our own hearts for uh, this time of communion. If Darwin is right, if Darwin is right, then we are nothing more than accidental byproducts of random chance. You carry out his whole line of thought. If he is right, we're nothing more than byproducts, accidental byproducts at that, of random chance, which means not a one of us in here entered into this world with any kind of inherent value. I mean, your being here is nothing more special than that squirrel being here we talked about earlier. Or the tree that was being burned in that fire. Or the rock that you have in your backyard. There is no inherent value. If you are the result of random chance. There is no inherent value to your existence. And that means there is also no inherent purpose to your life. Now maybe you can manufacture a purpose to your life, but by just your entering into this world, there's, there's no purpose attached to you. And so the question that many of us were exposed to back when we were in grade school or high school, you know, in those psychology classes that ask the question, why am I here? Well, no wonder people have wrestled so hard with that because there really isn't an answer to that if Darwin was right. But if, on the other hand, if this is right and what we've reviewed here this morning, that God took nothing and created everything out of it and he created man a part of his special creation made man in his own image. If this is right, then that means we have been made in the image of a loving God. And that means that we do have inherent value. From the very get-go, when we entered into this world, we had inherent value. And it also means we have inherent purpose to our lives. There is a reason why we're here. What I want to encourage you to do today during this time of communion is I want you to review that thought a little bit. 
Because during this time, when we take these trays, the smaller tray with the little pieces of bread, the larger tray with the cups of juice, we are, we are being reminded of one of the most significant events, the most significant event of all of human history, and that is when God left heaven in the person of Jesus, came to earth, and he died on a cross, not for his benefit, but for your benefit, because he valued you that much, because you have value. You had been created in God's image, and God valued you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you on the cross and when he was dead and buried he didn't stay dead he rose again signifying the victory that we all can be a part of that we all share in yeah during this time of communion as we reflect on the sacrifice that our Lord made on our behalf might it also remind us of how much God values us the highest price that was ever paid for anything in all of time, in the entire universe, was the price that was paid on the cross for you. That's your value in the eyes of God. And that is something worth celebrating. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the review of a fundamental truth that is found in the pages of your word. Thank you for refreshing our minds. Might we take it to heart. And might we see the implications that are involved with the reality of the fact that you are the creator. And you took nothing and created everything out of it. Father, we celebrate your power, your might, your holiness. And we also celebrate your love and your devotion to us that would cause you to do what you did in the sending of your son Jesus Lord might we never take that for granted might we see built right within that our own value but might we also see there's a reason we're here and that reason is to know you and to love you and to serve you 